Hey, I'm Chris and welcome back to my car channel. In my last video, I took you on the tour of my 1961 DeSoto. And in that video, I shared with you some of the cool and unique features of this car. And some of those features were innovative, while others were just plain weird. Well, since that video, I received a bunch of feedback from folks saying that I left out a bunch of items about this car and those items needed to be shared. And so this video is now part two. In my earlier video, I stated how DeSoto was conceived as a competitor to Oldsmobile and Mercury. Well, shortly after that video came out, a gentleman reminded me that Mercury didn't start as a car company until many years after. So there I stand corrected. Okay, so now with that out of the way, let's jump into the interior of this car. Here you have the typical headlight high beam switch on the floor, but also next to that switch is a button that when pressed with your foot, turns on the windshield wipers for one cycle. It's sort of like the intermittent wipers in today's cars, just manually activated. This car also has the four-way emergency flasher, a full seven years before it was federally mandated. Remember in that prior video I shared with you how this car has manually adjusted drum brakes and that they have an inherent cooling problem. Well, what I've been reminded of since that video is that a simple splash through a rain puddle can render these brakes useless. You see, water can get in between the brake shoes and the brake drum, and that layer of moisture creates lubrication between the two surfaces. And when that happens and you hit the brake pedal, well, nothing happens. The car doesn't slow down at all. That is until a few seconds later until the moisture burns off. But until that happens, it's sheer panic. And for some reason, on the driver's side of this car, the lug nuts are reverse threaded. That L stamped on the stud represents left-hand thread. Explain that to the mechanic. Next, it's under the seats. You see, with any car, you can adjust the fore and aft movement of the seats. But this seat track is on an angle, so pushing the seat rearward also lowers the seat, while pushing it forward raises it, giving an additional 2.5 inches of height. Plus, the front seat has two sets of mounting positions, allowing for an additional 2.5 inches of adjustment for taller or shorter drivers. Then you have plastic kick panels instead of the typical cardboard guys you'd find in other cars, which just plain makes sense for an area that's prone to getting wet and, well, kicked. A generously sized glove box with a handy section for road maps, a remote adjustable outside mirror here on the front fender, and probably the single best transmission made during that era, and that continued for years more, the torque flight. This transmission has three forward gears, which, granted, sounds antiquated when compared to today's 7, 8, and even 10-speed transmissions. But in 1961, both Ford and Chevy were mostly using two-speed automatic transmissions, making the torque flight figuratively and literally a gear ahead of the competition. Plus, this transmission is activated by a mechanical linkage that connects to the carburetor, allowing you to change the minimum RPM shift points for more aggressive or leisurely driving. All right, so all that's pretty cool, but one thing I was told I forgot on the last video was a walk around of the car. So let's do that now. I'll mix in some epic slow motion and some cool music too. So that was fun, so let's get back to the car. The designers of this car created this complex compound curve wraparound windshield. And they've had a bunch of other technological advances too, including the torsion air front suspension and the torque flight transmission. But they just weren't able to figure out how to clear a wet or dirty windshield using opposing windshield wipers. The rear view mirror on the dash allows for impressive outward visibility, however also provides an impressive view of any rear seat passengers. Considering the size and width of this car, it's surprisingly easy to maneuver in a parking lot as those rear directional stabilizers act as an endpoint for the body. Same with the front fender molding too. The amount of stainless steel on this car is oddly peculiar and it's here, 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 and here, here, here. And here, 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 and here, and there. On the electrical system, this car doesn't have fuses like you'd find on other cars. Instead, it has a circuit breaker. And that circuit breaker is contained within the headlight switch. 
you see power comes off the battery and goes directly to the headlight switch, and the headlight switch then distributes it to the different parts of the car. Now, if there's a short or an overload in the system, you'll hear the circuit breaker click with an audible sound to it, and then it will reset itself after a few seconds. If that short or overload continues, that circuit breaker will continue to click and reset until the short or overload is corrected. And finally, it's durability. You see, this car is meant to last a very long time, and if something goes wrong with the car, most of the parts on here can be rebuilt. There's no electronics anywhere on the car, and every function has a mechanical connection to it. Those push buttons on the dash, well, you push the drive button, that button operates a lever, that lever is connected to a cable, the cable goes to the transmission, and the car goes in the gear. You want to change the fan speed? Well, you push the fan speed button, that moves the cable, and the fan speed changes. If the electrical system isn't working, well, you open this box, you clean and adjust the contact points, and you're back in business. So that's my DeSoto. Oh, but wait, there was one more thing I was reminded about. Come on, let's go for a drive.